Well, welcome. Um, we're delighted to be doing uh, here at FCA our ninth uh, virtual conversation. Today, we are focused on a very um, important topic and one that I know the community is very interested in, and that is the dangers of unlicensed marijuana and its effects on our community, in particular, how it affects our youth. Um, I'm Rob Cashel. I am the CEO here at Family and Children's Agency, and I um, am delighted in a few minutes we'll introduce our expert panelists who will really um, be the ones answering some critical questions. For those of you who don't know Family and Children's Agency, we have a history of over 80 years in this community. We work with children, families, adults, and seniors. We do a variety of programs, everything from adoption to mental health and substance abuse services, after school programming, prevention and education for parents in the community, um, our senior service area and our services for the homeless. So today's topic I think is a very important one and we will get right into it because it is uh, a critical topic that I know you and the audience would like to hear from our experts. So let me introduce those experts. First, we have uh, Jess Vivenzio. Jess is the Director of Behavioral Health here at uh, Family and Children's Agency. Um, she's a licensed clinical social worker. She is certified in the uh, area of uh, trauma work and also is a certified uh, specialist in the addiction area. Welcome, Jess. We also have today Margaret Watt, who is the Director of Prevention and Education Services for Positive Directions, a true expert in the field, in particular around prevention and education, for issues around substance uh, use disorders. Welcome, Margaret. And then finally, we're delighted to have uh, Chief James Walsh, who is the police chief here in Norwalk. Um, he has been with the force for over 36 years and um, is really been focused on this topic uh, around um, illegal uh, marijuana sales and um, marijuana shops. So I think you've got three panelists who should hit all of the critical issues that we wanna talk about today. So having said that, let me get started. And um, Chief Walsh, if I can start with you, because one of the, the key questions is where are men, uh, marijuana products um, sold here in this community? And a critical question for so many of us is, what is the difference between licensed and unlicensed shops? Thank you, Rob, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, since 2021, the state of Connecticut has legalized uh, adult use cannabis um, in, in the city of Norwalk. Currently, we have two adult use cannabis stores with a third being uh, under construction right now on Connecticut Avenue. Uh, so right now there's three and I don't believe there's uh, any more being coming coming to town, any future plans. But since 2021, we've seen a, a huge explosion in the uh, illegal and unregulated uh, sales of cannabis and other dangerous high THC products in many commercial establishments in town uh, under the guise of smoke shops that more or less came onto the scene to support adult use cannabis and other retail markets where people are taking advantage of the mindset that many people do believe and young adults believe that cannabis is illegal for everybody's consumption, but you have to be 21 and above. It's adult use cannabis and people are just uh, freely going into uh, commercial establishments and buying cannabis and other dangerous products right over the counter. And we've been very vigorous in our investigation of these sales. We're well over a dozen investigations and successfully made arrests and executed search warrants and recovered well over hundreds of pounds of unregulated, uninspected uh, uh, marijuana and cannabis, which can be dangerous. Terrific. So, Margaret, let me swing over to you. What are some of the risks of purchasing marijuana from an unlicensed shop? Um, Rob, that's a good question. There are many risks. Uh, the reason when, when Connecticut decided to lease, um, legalize adult use cannabis, there were a lot of um, 
protections put in place. So the original cannabis bill was almost 900 pages. And then there have been hundreds of pages of amendments since then. And a lot of it is trying to make sure that the products that are out there for legal use of adults over age 21 are tested, regulated, um, the, the amount of the product you get and the amount of THC it contains, which is the psychoactive ingredient, are all supposed to be labeled. You're supposed to know what you're getting. So when people are getting stuff from vape shops, vape shop, when we talk about vape shops or smoke shops, as the chief said, you know, these are places that are, are selling vapes or cigarettes, tobacco products, right? They do not have a license to sell cannabis, i.e. marijuana. That means if they are selling it, when people go in there, this is basically a street drug, right? So no one's testing it. No one's quality controlling it. Um, they don't, they're not going to be able to tell you this has this percent THC. This is how strong it is. This is how, they're not going to tell you anything about that. And one of the drug busts that the chief's um, department made this summer found hundreds of cannabis products that had fentanyl in them. And fentanyl is highly, highly addictive and also very frequently fatal. Um, and so that it's, you know, let the buyer beware. You don't know what you're getting. Yeah. Um, Jess, Margaret was talking about um, that some of these products can be laced with other drugs. Um, what are some of the other drugs? I know uh, Margaret mentioned um, fentanyl, but other drugs as well? Something we are keeping on the radar is the increase in xylazine that we are seeing as well. We, even from a you know, substance use disorder treatment program perspective, we have seen clients come in who are testing positive for marijuana that's been laced with fentanyl. Obviously, that's a huge concern you know, because of the risk of overdose and even more so with the xylazine. Um, it's a new drug, quote unquote, new drug, um, but it's uh, increasing in frequency. We are starting to see it and uh, it is, it's, something that we all need to be aware of. Um, it is not an opioid. So the biggest concern with the xylazine, if it is laced in anything, is that even if something like Narcan is used, it, um, the Narcan will not reverse the effect of the, of the xylazine in the opioid. Rob, if I can add the, uh, Please. I just wanted to Add another contaminant that's been found in, in illegal or sorry, unlicensed um, cannabis products in the state is mold. So sometimes these vape shops are selling moldy, you know, like products because these are leaves coming from who knows where someone's turning it like it's flower, it's bud, whatever they're selling. It's again, there are many health concerns that can come from that. And that's quite apart from the fact that if it's being sold sort of under the table at a smoke shop, then your kids might be getting it. Right, because it's already an illegal sale. So who's carding to see if this is an adult? Yeah. So a question really for all of you, and Chief Walsh, please jump in first. Is there any way of knowing whether uh, these uh, this marijuana being sold has been laced? Is there any way of finding that out or knowing that? Yes, our our ability to test products it starts with the field kits. We have field test kits, but any uh, empirical test needs to be done by the state of Connecticut lab where we send samples. Um, but sometimes that takes some time to get final results with toxicology and, and, and just final final results. But we usually make presumptive tests um, on scene using uh, on scene field test kits. Gotcha, gotcha. So yes. that's at the Martin. point where the police are already involved, right? So from a consumer perspective, you don't know. You can't tell if something's laced. You don't know what the quality is. If people who are using cannabis um, should really, you know, who are using it for medical purposes, for re recreational purposes, should be over 21 and they should be buying it at Shangri-La or Fine Fettle, which are the only two licensed stores in, in Norwalk. Right. So uh, Chief Walsh, how difficult did is it to close down these illegal shops? Well, it, it all depends on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You have to understand under planning and zoning rules, people do have the right to uh, conduct business. And uh, we have to work with city governments um, to see if they're continually involved in criminal enterprise. And uh, more or less, they're, they're there for the main premise of illegal sales and illegal activities. And, and, and work with uh, 
our local municipal government to create code and legislation to take action to prevent the further sales of these places. And sometimes it does take closure of uh, these businesses and the withdrawal of their license. But uh, we are working uh, closely with no City of Norwalk as many municipalities are working with their police departments as they've seen this problem grow. Uh, Norwalk is not just, Norwalk, it, this is not just occurring in Norwalk, this is occurring all throughout the state where we've seen this mindset that marijuana is legal, T high THC products is legal, and they're selling it out of regular commercial establishments. So uh, as with mm -hmm. most things that occur in society, the natural process, you know, things occur and we have to adapt. And, and that, I think we're in the uh, adapt process right now. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm curious, maybe starting with you, Margaret, but please, uh, Jess and Chief, please jump in. With the proliferation of these unlicensed shops, how much does that increase the um, accessibility for minors in terms of getting into marijuana that could be very dangerous? Um, absolutely, it does increase access to anyone, right? Um, I think to the, you know, the corollary to what the chief just said is all of us are trying to adapt as a society. And I think the stores that are selling marijuana, most of them know they shouldn't be, but especially a couple of years ago, some of them were selling this thinking they were able to, right? They thought, you know, this it's now legal. Why wouldn't I sell it? We found um, THC gummies for sale at a yoga shop in a neighboring town and some of the work that we do at Positive Directions. And they didn't intend to sell anything illegal. I think now the store owners know. Um, I think what we have to do is educate the parents that, you know, this is not legal under age 21 and it's only for, it's not legally for sale in vape shops. I think people honestly don't know that they might be buying something illegal. In every state in the country, as marijuana, uh, as recreational or retail marijuana has been legalized for adults, youth have have seen it as a more accepted and normal practice. So just this, as soon as the cannabis laws change anywhere, it normalizes the view among teens that marijuana is okay, that it's safe. People are like, oh, it's natural. Um, you know, what's natural is a plant with about 1% to 3% THC. Back in the uh, in the old days, um, vape products that are like 99% THC with no CBD left, no plant matter, that is not natural. That's just a pure injection of drug into your developing brain. Um, and um, so there's a lot of myths to combat, but everywhere we see that kids now change their views on marijuana and think it's safer. And it really, it's not just the unlicensed marijuana that's not safe. For youth, cannabis and other substances impact directly the part of the brain that is still developing. And so you're basically damaging your brain. There are multiple studies that show up to eight points of IQ loss in teens who use marijuana a couple times a week. And I don't think any of us want to see that. So um, there are a lot of risks. Yeah. Rob, I think you answer... Go ahead, please. I'm so sorry. I think my volume is not low. So I'm trying to speak louder. Um, but, right. you know, Rob, I think just answering your question, you know, when these smoke shops are selling marijuana, it's it just opens the door for more and more consumption. Um, and it opens the door for youth who is, I think that as a community in particular, we are really looking to in provide more education at home, at school, in the community to make sure that they are aware to, because based on, you know, going off of what Margaret said, it's very similar to alcohol, right? We've now legalized it. People are making a lot of comparisons, um, but you know, alcohols can be harmful, can be harmful for people over the age of 21. Um, marijuana, cannabis particularly can be incredibly harmful for people under the age of 21. It affects your prefrontal cortex, like Margaret said. It affects your developing brain, like Margaret said. And so um, it's incredibly important that as a community, we're aware of this, but as parents and guardians or caregivers of young people, um, that we're all we're informed so that we're not afraid to have the conversation. Right, right. So you know, we're talking about the dangers of just marijuana that is not laced with other drugs. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in more greater detail, the the real dangers of things? 
that have been laced with fentanyl, um, celazine. What what are the the true dangers that young people in particular face when they wind up with marijuana that has been laced with one of those types of drugs? Sure, Margaret, I can, I can start with in. you. Or you just jump in. Jess, oh, go ahead, right? Jess. Sure. You know, I think- We're a very it, polite group, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, the, the scariest part is if we have a young, a young adolescent who 14, 15 years old who buys marijuana thinking it's marijuana, you know, it, it is laced with fentanyl. If they've, if they've never had any type of other substance use before, the smallest amount of fentanyl can cause an overdose. And so, mm -hmm. like Margaret said earlier in the in the conversation, you know, most people don't know if the drug is laced until they have consumed it. And so if you aren't aware of what an overdose could look like, I mean, that that feeling is is terrifying, especially for an adolescent who doesn't have that knowledge. Um, they are not, I would imagine they're not prepared, right? They're not carrying Narcan. Um, you know, but the 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 risk for overdose with marijuana laced with fentanyl, marijuana laced with xylazine is incredibly high. Um, and I think there's just not enough, there's not enough education, there's not enough awareness. Um, I think we're, we'll end up talking a bit about Narcan a little bit later. So I'll pass it to Margaret. Well, I agree with everything Jess just said, but I would add, you know, the marijuana by itself without being laced is dangerous to youth who can overdose on it. So a, a, a pretty popular myth out there is that you can't overdose on marijuana. So overdose doesn't always mean die, right? You can overdose, meaning you have such a full body, mental, whatever reaction that you basically need to go to the hospital. And we have data from Brian Weeks at Norwalk Health Department looking at how many young people and older adults have been hospitalized in the last year for cannabis overdoses. And it is, you know, it's it's scary to see that there's a lot of kids. And we had, I think, three between um, March of 2023 and, and um, you know, one year later in 24, there were three kids under 10 who were hospitalized for cannabis overdoses here in Norwalk. Um, in addition, there were plenty of teens, there were plenty of adults. So one thing people should realize is, you know, there are teens who are passing around like dab pens that are um, consuming THC in almost pure levels, and it can make them pass out right away. Um, I know there are some students who think that's funny. They're like, oh, they couldn't take it, right? They couldn't handle their stuff we should be teaching our kids that nothing should make you pass out, right? That is so far from normal. Um, people shouldn't be going to the hospital because they've consumed a product that has shut down their brain temporarily. Um, you know, so there's, and the other thing with cannabis is in young adults, the high, the high, high THC levels are associated with um, more frequent um, episodes of psychosis. Um, people who have maybe a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia can actually lead to them developing schizophrenia. Um, there's a lot of things that our hospitals are seeing that people should be watching out for. Yeah, I, I had one question in the chat in regards to edibles. Um, yes, please. Besides, besides the you know the, the the cannabis, which we can immediately identify as contraband and illegal when we go in these smoke shops if it's loose green cannabis. Uh, we take uh, inspectors from consumer protection who have the ability to scan products and determine th th if they're uh, safe, or I should say not safe, but uh, illegal or contraband. Um, based on its packaging, a lot of times it appears to be safe and legal, but it's not. And they have a scanner which determines uh, what kind of product it is. So we've, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if it be like um, Skittles or Fritos or something mm -hmm. like that, they're packaging them in bright Packaging, which appears to be candy and snacks, and a lot of these products are illegal. So it's not just cannabis; it's high THC products, and and it's it's varied. It's varied. Uh, yeah. um, they'll come back with uh, varied products and things that would look like you'd walk by every single day in a gas station or a, or a shop, thinking that they were legal. And chief, you said these are legal, correct? No, there's some are legal, some are illegal. So right. That's why we have to take the consumer protection uh, investigator with us to discern which ones are legal and legal, and they have the ability to scan the, the barcode and be able to tell you. But the point was is that 
they appear legal by the packaging because it looks like candy or snack, but they're actually illegal. THC, gummies, and such like that. So it's not just raw cannabis that we're looking for. We're, they're usually doing a, a search warrant for the, all the products inside the store. It's a scary thing, right, that parents have to be talking to their kids about and and monitoring what, you know, I think we all have to look at the packaging in those like convenience stores and gas station shops very carefully. And what does it say? And what is it really? And sometimes they'll have like, if it's an illegal product that looks like Fritos, like the chief said, you know, maybe one letter is different, one piece of the color is different, or somewhere it might say something to imply that it's a drug. But if you've got kids going in there, or they might accidentally, they might not even be trying to buy illegal weed products, but they're getting them. Um, and um, an activity I did with some teens last year over at our, with our friends at the Youth Business Initiative, we asked kids to write stickies with all their questions about marijuana um, and vaping. And then we would just sort of pick them out of a hat and kind of answer them. And one of the questions that I've quoted many times was someone wrote, is gas station weed safe? And so that was a kid who obviously is aware that there was weed at some gas station near them. And they're asking if it's safe, which I would like to think we can all answer resoundingly. There's no way gas station weed is safe because you nobody knows where that came from. <laughs> right. Right. So in, in many ways, it, it almost sounds like an overwhelming challenge. And, and Chief, I guess a question that just came in, um, do you think smoke shops are being um, held accountable for what they what they sell, and uh, and the other portion of the question is: there anything that the community can do to help address this issue? Well, the, the people that we arrest, but they're they're usually the clerks, the clerks or the the person that they hire at eight o'clock, nine o'clock. So when you say the smoke shops, are we talking about the owners, the permittees, the backers? And that goes back to my my earlier point. We're, we're working on code and legislation to hold the premise, the permittee accountable for allowing the actions of their employee and knowing what was going on there, the illegal sales and stuff. So that, that's still a work in progress. Several communities have already moved forward with legislation to do that. Uh, NOAA did come out with legislation last year, um, regulating the amount of smoke shops and the distance between them. So that, that is helpful and that's the, the first step in combating this. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Um, just, you know, is there anything that- uh, Oh, the community can do. The community yeah. in general can do to address this issue. Yeah, report it. You know, uh, yeah. we, we had the, you know, we're fortunate here at Noah Police. If you go to your app store and search Noah Police, you'll find a Noah Police app and you download it and you can text us anonymously. It goes through servers, so it's anonymous, um, and you can provide information, you can provide pictures, and it goes to uh, combined dispatch, it goes to the chiefs, and we push it out to certain investigators. And we get a lot of good information about varied crimes and incidents that do occur in NOAA, and we have gotten drug information on that uh, text line. And plus, you know, there, there's other, if you go to our website, there's other, other means of anonymous reporting. We understand the concerns of uh, of reporting in 2024. So there's a, a lot of ways to remain anonymous. Yeah. Chief, I, I'm interested in, you made reference to the different jurisdictions. Is there um, an attempt to really coordinate with other communities so that there's some consistency between one municipality as opposed to another, or is that something that's still kind of in process? That's sort of out of my wheelhouse um, in regards to legislation and code. I, I, that's usually corporate council and, and, and city councils. So yeah. I do believe there's discussion. I know this, this is a growing problem. So there's ongoing discussion among communities on what they're doing and what is effective and what is not effective. So I think that uh, everybody has the same goal um, and they are creating uh, legislation and regulation to prevent it. Mm hmm. Rob, I can add on to that, that, you know, the Please. state level legislation is the same across the whole state. Um, and I, sh I should mention all of our organizations here, we're all part of the Norwalk Partnership. And anyone listening to this who wants to join us is welcome. It's a coalition of community members and organizations working together to keep youth substance free and promote youth mental wellness in Norwalk. Um, and one of the things we do is a legislative forum every year, and we do it in conjunction with other local towns. And 
the legislative advocacy that we've done and other coalitions in the state has led to improvements and safeguards in the cannabis law year after year, as well as other laws. Um, so what happens at the state level is going to affect everyone. And that's where we do really want to work with other communities locally. There's the, you know, common council and the planning and zoning and everybody can do local ordinances. And so the chief alluded to something really great that planning and zoning did last year and passed through the council, which this past spring, which was to change um, the number of vape shops that we could have and smoke shops in town, and they have to be a mile apart. But I mean, I live in town and you've been, you know, the last few years, you would drive down any street corner and there was a new shop popping up all the time. And now they're not opening that much anymore because of that. And it makes it probably slightly easier for the police department to monitor the ones that are there because it's still a lot of shops that have to be visited regularly. Um, and a smoke shop, I will also say smoke shops are ones that are dedicated to smelling, selling smoke products. But we all know there's like gas stations that have, you know, a few products here and there, but that's not their main product line. So I do think the citizen action is really helpful if people report what they see. Yeah, gotcha. So, you know, we, we're talking about um, smoke shops, illegal smoke shops in particular. Um, Chief Walsh, how hard is it to close the illegal um, smoke shops down? Is that, a, is that a challenge for the police department? Certainly it is difficult. Yes, it is. There, there is, is legislation at the state level. It's called nuisance abatement, but it's very difficult to get a nuisance abatement case. You have to completely uh, prove that the whole purpose of the business is to conduct a criminal business. The whole purpose of what is going on there is to conduct criminal business and they're using it as a front to conduct criminal business. But I am confident that we will see progress uh, soon in, in regulating uh, the city of Norwalk uh, based on discussions that I have had so far. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the challenges in terms of that, Rob, has been, and we've talked about this at Norwalk partnership meetings with the chief and everybody, is that sometimes these stores that are engaging in criminal sales um, change their owner. That was what, you know, that's another aspect of, you know, the chief was talking about, do you find the clerk or can you find the owner? Because that's the ultimate responsible person. We've seen this issue in the state where, and in Norwalk where places get busted repeatedly, they keep paying the fines that are just honestly not as prohibitive as they should be. Um, and then at some point it's like, oh, it, I don't own that business anymore. I'm selling it to my cousin, Jess, over here. And now she's the name on the business and it sets, it resets the clock to zero. And I think that is one of our challenges going into this next legislative session. That's a policy issue that really needs to, we need to find a way to try to address that. So, so a question that came in, and really it can be for any of you. In fact, it'd be interesting to hear all of you comment. Question came in from our audience. Um, why was cannabis legalized in the first place? I see a lot of nodding heads. So Jess, you want to take a shot at it first? Uh, sure. You know, so my perspective comes from a treatment provider, right? I'm a, I'm a licensed mm -hmm. clinician. Um, it's who I am as a, as a human. And I think there's a lot of answers to that question um, from my perspective I think part of the reason why it was legalized is because we have a lot of people who are arrested and imprisoned for cannabis use, for um, having, you know, drugs, illegal drugs on their person. And um, it's done, it, you know, is done in a manner that is not necessarily just or equal of all different types of people. Um, so aside, you know, I'll let Margaret and the chief kind of talk more about legality and all of that. But I think, you know, coming from a clinician's point of view, um, it was relatively common. Um, there's a lot of stigma attached to substances. There still are, there's always going to be. Um, but I think there were kind of cultural aspects to this as well. Mm -hmm. Margaret. Or Chief, do you want to weigh in on this uh, Margaret, go interesting ahead. question? Go ahead, Chief. Did you start? No, go ahead. Now I was referring, I was deferring to you. Oh, okay. Well, I think, you know, Jess is pointing to the kind of racial and social equity component, and there absolutely, you know, have been 
um, really inequities in the, especially in the past before Connecticut, because we decriminalized marijuana before we made it legal, right? That's different. Like how do you address people who are doing something versus um, can everyone do it? Um, so we decriminalized first, but things were very inequitable. So there was that component, but I also think, you know, we have a general adult population that, you know, if you grew up in my era in high school, we were told that cannabis wasn't addictive and it wasn't a really serious drug. And it was, of course, not genetically engineered the way it has been today. And so I think we have an adult population that pretty much didn't know it could be harmful to youth in particular. So from lack of harm and a lot of people who want to use it and they don't want to think they're doing something illegal, there was pressure on politicians to legalize it. Um, but I would still say follow the money. So my view um, coming from the prevention perspective here is that the bottom line is states legalized marijuana one by one for the income. Um, it was already a black market. You legalize it and then you think we can regulate it. We can get some tax income. So Connecticut, you know, had been in the hole financially for a long time. All of a sudden it's the, there aren't a lot of opportunities to add an entire new business market. And you do, and you bring in state revenue and Norwalk's bringing in local revenue. Um, and at the same time, your black market proliferates um, because now you've, you know, made it seem like a more normal market. But if there, if there weren't an income, um, if there weren't a tax break to doing it, I don't know if our legislators would have done it. I think, you know, people need money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, any... just as in Margaret's point, I think, uh, there's a few few points. Uh, the, definitely the criminal justice reform angle of the decriminalization of marijuana, um, the recognized medical legal issues, uses, I should say, the medical legal uses of marijuana. And there is uh, changing attitudes and public support in American society. So we are a democratic nation at the end of the day. So uh, if public support and changing attitudes go a long way. Sure. Let, let me switch gears towards uh, parents. We have, uh, and there's a lot to talk about relative to, to parents and what they can do to, to really keep their kids safe. I, I'm curious, is there a particular concern with Halloween approaching? Has that been something that either from the police mm -hmm. department or the provider side has led to some concerns? Um, Jess, I see you shaking your head. I think you're on view. No. <laughs> we'll swing over to you, Margaret. We'll come back to you, Jess. Well, when you said, are there any concerns with Halloween? My eyes widen, Rob, Rob, because I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, I mean, parents should always be trying to keep an eye out for what's in their Halloween, the kids' Halloween candy anyway, but there's 100% the risk that they that kids would be getting gummies or some kind of edible form of marijuana that that another household might have accidentally thought was the you know that it was a Snickers bar but it was actually a marijuana one. So parents in general not just at Halloween should be telling their kids that you can't eat something that looks like a candy unless some trusted adult has told you it's okay. And so the trusted adults then, it behooves them to really pay attention to what their kids are accessing. Yeah, in regards to that that topic, uh, we haven't received any specific information or intelligence to say, you know, Halloween is a threat or anything like that. But for years, um, we always just give the guidance that parents should follow the, the normal protocols they've been doing for years. You know, if your children go enjoy Halloween trick or treating, but at the end of the night, you know, look at what they have. Make sure the packaging is intact. Making sure that the packaging is what you normally see in the stores. Um, inspect it and just look at it. the things that were done five, six, seven, fifteen years ago. Those those same protocols uh, still work today, just to be safe. Yeah. Jess, can you talk? Can I? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're back. What do you Great. think about back. Halloween? <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Thank you both for stepping in. Um, I was just going to say, it's something that's come up for us, um, in program. It's something that, you know, um, I've had clients ask 
about at FCA and outside of FCA. Um, and something I think a lot of people want to be keeping an eye out for is the edibles. Um, I know I stepped out for a second. I'm not sure if anyone mentioned that, but to Margaret's point earlier, um, reading the packaging incredibly carefully. Um, you know, a lot of parents check their kids' Halloween candy anyway, which is great. Please don't stop doing that. Uh, but anything gummy, um, you know, please just read it extremely, extremely carefully because I don't, I don't think it's going to be something that happens consistently or, or frequently, but I do think it's something that absolutely could happen. Gotcha. So staying with the parent um, aspect of, of this, um, any advice that um, you all could give to parents in terms of, you know, noticing the signs of, of marijuana use among their children, um, and obviously, any signs that might become apparent if it happens to be marijuana that's laced with one of these very dangerous yeah. other drugs. Any any signs that 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 can help parents kind of keep an eye on this? Sure, I can. Just, I can help. Yeah. Sure. Um. So, you know, I think with with marijuana, a lot of people know, right? You your eyes could be bloodshot. You might. The smell, I think, is kind of the most poignant. Um, but I think aside from the more visible signs, I think it's looking at who your kids are hanging out with. Have their friendship patterns changed at all recently? Are they spending more time out of the home than they normally did? Are they spending shorter periods of time out of the home than they normally did? Is their bedroom window open more than it normally has been? <laughs> Um, you know, I've also worked with parents who have, if their kids walk to and from school or walk to and from the bus route, are there smoke shops that they walk by? You know, look at where your kids are going. Do you know their friends? Do you know their friends' parents? Um, I think the more open, kind of transparent conversations that we can have with kids is one thing, but this is a community effort, right? It takes a village. Um and if you know your kids' friends and if you know your kids' friends' parents, it's not all on you. You know, you know what's happening at your house. They know what's happening at their house. Um, really just kind of getting as many people on board. And I think Mark, looking for changes in behavior, right? If your kid used to talk to you about anything, um, you still use leave the door bedroom door open, wouldn't mind showing you something on their phone, like look at this funny meme or whatever. And all of a sudden they're becoming really secretive and closed off. I mean, whatever that's the sign of, it might be depression, it might be substance use, whatever it is, it's a warning sign. I think you wanna just look at changes in behavior. You wanna keep those channels of communication open. Um, and then like, those are sort of signs to like look out for, but I also just wanna wave this at the camera and say that we have this nice little, infographic from the Norwalk Partnership. So on the Norwalk Partnership uh, marijuana page, we have it in English and Spanish. And it's just like prevention tips for parents. If your kid's in elementary school, four things to do when they're in middle school, add this, high school. So just educate yourself and support your kids and be open. Yeah. Chief, any particular message that um, the police department would want to share with parents around this, this issue? There's so much messaging that you can't control that your children receive nowadays from peers and social media, television. When they walk down the street, they see this, they see that. Your messaging has to be strong. Your communication has to be stronger. You have to be engaged. You have to find out. And there's a lot of many ways that Jess and Margaret have mentioned, but your messaging has to be early. It has to be often and it has to be continued. Bottom line. Right. There's a there's a great app that parents can download. It's from the federal government, from SAMHSA. It's called Talk, They Hear You. And it's a free app on all the app stores. And you can download that. And it gives you points for having early and frequent conversations with your kids around substance use. So earlier than you think, 
right? Like early elementary, you can start. Um, and and it and it gives you pointers and tells you how to communicate, how to continue the conversation, how to answer their questions. Because a lot of times parents are like, I'm not talking about this with my kid because I don't know what to say. What if they ask me if I've used this substance? What if they, you know, so like get the app. It's called Talk They Hear You. Right. right. So a message that you're all sharing is the importance of parents um, you know, being very clear, um, noticing signs. Um, I know Chief, you know, being very clear and direct in terms of the messaging. Um, I'm going to assume that parents who maybe notice some of these behaviors and hope it will go away is probably not a solution to what's going on. Would you? I see you shaking your head, Margaret. We all were, right? Yeah, jump on it. <laughs> Don't wait. Intervene early. Um, if a kid, if a kid is starting to use substances, first of all, they are in the outlier. They are an outlier. Most kids actually are not. We have data, Norwalk data, state data, national data that says most kids don't do this stuff. So if your kid is, see it as a red flag, as a warning sign. Um, you want to find out why. Is it is it self medication for depression or anxiety? Is it a friend group that does this? Was it a one time curiosity thing? But you know, connect them to a counselor. Let's like assess what their needs are, make sure they're getting the counseling, the peer support, um, give them positive social outlets and just send clear messages that you're like, we we don't want you to do this. Um, don't beat around the bush. Like in this household, we want you to be safe. We want you to be legal. Wait till you're an adult. Don't mess with your developing brain. All those messages. Um, and another thing I'll just throw in there because I realize as we're talking about parents, Rob, we haven't mentioned Parents have substances in the house. You might have legal cannabis for your own use. You might have alcohol. You might have prescription drugs. Keep them locked up. That's the best way. You know, lock. We have lock bags that we can give out in small um, quantities. You can buy locks for your liquor cabinet, your medicine cabinet. Just don't make it even available. You know, that's a great point, Margaret. Because one could guess that a uh, a teenager might say to a parent, "Hey, why are you after me?" You're using you use it, mm -hmm. and uh, and that that's a tough one to to answer, I would think. But my brain's developed, and you know yours is still maturing. Uh huh. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. I right. want to validate how I want to validate how difficult these conversations can be to have. Right. Sitting down at the dinner table, and all of a sudden, if you've never brought this up before, bringing this up can feel so intimidating, mm -hmm. and it's a lot scarier to have a conversation after something has happened, you know? So I think opening the door for these conversations and preparing yourselves as best as you possibly can, you know, we can't share information if we don't have the information. So there's so much knowledge and information out there. The partnership website is fantastic. You know, Norwalk PD posts about the smoke shops that they bust all the time. So consume as much knowledge about it as you can, and then be able to in, have a well-informed conversation with your with your kids um, in a way that's not like judgmental too, you yeah. know, because if that conversation comes off as judgmental or that you are not going to be a support for them if something were to happen or if they are not able to trust coming to you for something, it's really hard to gain that back. Yeah. I, I'm going to guess, Chief, that it is a challenge if you are involved in investigating uh, the illegal use of marijuana, whether it's through an illegal shop or whatever with young people, and then you discover that the parents are maybe heavily involved themselves. That, that I would guess, could be, from, even from the police department standpoint, a challenging issue. Well, that's where you, you need to balance it. You, you know, it, technically, if the parents are using adult cannabis, it's legal. That's yeah. where the state has stated that there are, so we have to stay um, objective and not subjective and just say, hey, we're here to investigate the illegal sales. Um, and if the kids are consuming it and, and uh you know, we're exposing the dangers of it and, and exposing the 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 arrest and letting it be known to everybody that hey, these places are do, 
participating in this business and doing this. And uh, we're given the, the notorieties out there that it's occurring. Um, if the state has the state has approved adult use cannabis, uh, we stay out of the judgment business. Um, so we're we're here to investigate uh, what's going on, and 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 we'll investigate. And a lot of times, if uh, kids are caught with marijuana, it's usually a referral process for services to the uh, you know juvenile court systems or, or another diversionary program. Um, so that that's that's the route we we normally take. Yeah. Uh, Chief, do you feel, and this is maybe not just a, a Norwa question, but in general for police departments, do you feel there are enough resources to be able to really identify the illegal shops? And and I mean, it it sounds, as I said earlier, a, a bit overwhelming with how this has kind of exploded as an issue. Are there resources, do you think, there? Yeah, in, in Norwalk, there's, there's resources. Uh, we, we've been able to... Uh, do what we needed to do. Uh, I, I can't speak for other smaller communities that, that may have this problem that don't have the investigative bandwidth to do all this because it takes a lot of work. It takes it takes a lot of work and it takes weeks and warrants and affidavits and a lot of report writing and, and evidence to be seized and stuff like that. So it's not just a boom, boom process. It's just, it's something that takes, it's very, shall I say, uh, methodical in the, in the investigation. Yeah. That, that's the way the prosecutors want it. That's the way the courthouses want it. So, and it's legally, we have to do it according to Fourth Amendment. Um, it is still a private business. So, uh, our resources are adequate. Um, I, I really can't speak for any other agencies, but I do see arrests occurring in other agencies. So, I think mm -hmm. people are, to my previous point, adapting to what they're seeing also. Yeah, and I, I assume that probably also includes checking shops to see if their sales are legal or illegal. Is that part of kind of the, the process? We don't have the regulatory function of checking. Um, okay. We can't, we don't have the ability to inspect. We're the police and the fourth amendment requires us to have a search warrant to go and inspect pri private premises. Uh, that That's the, that's under the health department. The health department has the ability to, uh, and it, it's all part of the new um things that are being created to go inspect businesses that engage in businesses that have public involvement, public uh, consumption, public contact, uh, things that are in, involved with public safety and welfare through, uh, that fall under the premise of the health department. They have inspectors to do that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Let's switch a little bit to something we hear so much about, and that is, um, uh, the the use of Narcan and how that um, can be used and can be used maybe as a in some cases a life saving um, drug for certain substances that might be um, laced in marijuana. Um, tell me, and Margaret, let me start with you. Tell me a little bit about Narcan, the drugs that it it does create a life saving um, antidote. Um, some that it doesn't. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just saying a little bit about that. Sure. So Narcan is the um, trade name or the brand name of a generic, a product that generically is called naloxone. And it is, it is an amazing, potentially life-saving um, medication, medicine that can revive someone who has overdosed. Now the person has to have overdosed on an opioid. So opioids are a number of things, right? It, um, Percocet, um, you know, oxy, um, there are lots of uh, fentanyl, heroin, there are many different kinds of opioids, um, but opioids are painkillers. They're prescribed um, by doctors if you have a surgery, if you have your teeth out, things like that. A lot of people have them in their medicine cabinet. If you take too many, it will depress your central nervous system. You will slowly stop breathing and die. And Narcan it administered in, at the right moment can reverse the process, um, restore breathing, give you time to get to the hospital where you really need to be medically monitored for a while um, and potentially save a life. Now, since a lot of times um, people are using or overdosing on fentanyl, which is very strong, you may need several doses of Narcan. Um, if, it's, if there's xylazine involved, as Jess mentioned earlier, xylazine is not an opioid, so the Narcan won't save that person from that. But 
we do free, we like Positive Directions and many of our partners in the community, we do free Narcan trainings on a regular basis because we want everyone to know how to recognize a possible overdose and administer Narcan. And the more of us have Narcan, the better, because you don't know who you might be able to stumble upon and reverse at least the opioid part while 911 is on its way, call 911, get that person in the hospital, let them deal with whatever drugs might be in the system, but you really can potentially save a life. Um, and I have a Narcan training I'm doing for free at Norwalk Public Library coming up on the 13th at 6 p.m. at the main library branch. And people can register and you know come and learn a lot about different types of overdose and what you can do, um, but walk away with the actual resources in a Narcan kit. That's great. Jess, um, Narcan I know is available here, right? For clients um, that we might be working with. Um, you wanna say a little bit about that? So Connecticut made some some pretty big strides in the last few years when it comes to Narcan and you can get it over the counter and you can also get it through a prescription. Um, at FCA, our, the majority of our staff in behavioral health are all Narcan trained and our co-occurring program project reward all of our staff are Narcan trained and carry Narcan on them. We also strongly encourage that all of our clients go through Narcan training and carry Narcan on them. Um, an astounding number of our clients have used Narcan and have reversed an overdose for a friend or a family member. Um, you know, and that's not an experience that you hope that anyone has to have, but, you know, thankfully they were there and they had it on them. Um, so a lot of people ask me, like, should I do this? Why would I carry Narcan? Yes, you should carry Narcan um, because because you don't ever know. Um, you could be walking and taking the train out of Sono and someone has overdosed and you're not sure what's happening. And like you could be the one that makes that difference for that person. Yeah. Chief, from the police uh, perspective, the use of Mar Narcan, is that something that officers would have access to? Oh yeah, every officer carries Narcan on them and a lot of them actually carry it on their duty belts. Probably going back three years to four years since officers, we started to deploy Narcan. We've made, we, well, unfortunately it's become commonplace. Uh, we used to give out awards for Narcan saves and stuff like that. And now it's it's become mm -hmm. unfortunately um, an operating procedure. Uh, officers are going all the time and, and we're, we're, we're saving. Uh, at one point we were recording the amount of saves that we were doing. Um, but it's, it's I'm, I'm going to say probably over since we've deployed heart, Narcan, we're into the dozens of saves uh, of Narcan. Uh, just finding someone down and just, we, just for an instance, a, a small reference, we thought an individual got hit by a car on South Main Street. He was found mm -hmm. lying in the middle of the street. We thought he, he got like, a hit and run kind of situation. And uh, the officer gave him Narcan and he was on his feet 15 seconds later. And yeah. he wasn't hit by a car. He had taken mm -hmm. he had taken the heroin bag and laced and he had wandered into the road and collapsed. And he was, we thought he, and we were out there and the officer just Narcan them unknown what was wrong with him because we didn't have any information walking into the situation of what occurred to him. We just found him down. And 15 seconds later, he was standing up and wow. he was fine. So we, there's there's lots and lots of those stories and Narcan saves are occurring on a weekly basis. And that's a good example because you, like you said, you didn't know what happened and you guys yeah. gave him Narcan. And, and Jess was talking about that too. If you stumble upon someone, there's really no harm, no foul to administering Narcan. People aren't yes. allergic to it. It's not addictive. There aren't side effects like... At worst, it didn't do anything because it wasn't an opioid overdose. At best, you brought them back to life, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. So we have uh, just a few minutes. This hour went by very fast. But I want to make sure that the people tuning in hear from three wonderful experts. And again, many thanks for, for doing this today. What would you like the audience to be left with in terms of, of messaging today? Um, and let me start with you, Jess, and we'll go right around. What would you like the audience to, to walk away with if there was one or two things? You're mute again. 
and we're <laughs> muted again. So we'll wait for Jess to come back. And Margaret, I'll go to you. Um, I think number one, we all need to educate ourselves and be well informed. Um, adults need to be talking to parents about the risks of substances and practicing refusal skills with them because we didn't mention that. And I think that's a huge one. Help walk kids through scenarios of like, what if someone offers you this? What if someone says that? What could you do to get out of it? What's a different excuse? Let's practice a few times so that so that they're locked and loaded for if that occasion arises. Um, the other thing I would say is um, join the Norwalk Partnership. Be a part of our coalition that we're all in working together to try to make this community safe for our kids. Terrific. Yes, are you back? Am I back? No. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Oh, there. I sure I sure hope so. Um I I just want to thank everyone for for being on this call, right? There's a reason that you are here today. Whether however you found the virtual conversation information, you joined today to get information. And I think that is one of the most important things that we can do for each other, for ourselves and for the community. Um, I think continuing to educate yourselves so that you can continue to educate others. That's how this works. Um, we can't do it all ourselves and we shouldn't do it all ourselves. Um, you know, you know your kids, you know your family, you know your friends. And so you just never know the impact that you can have on them if you have the information. Terrific. And Chief Walsh, anything you would like to leave the audience with today? Yeah, if uh, people see something, say something, uh, report it. If they, if you get information or you see something that's suspicious, if you walk into a gas station or a grocery store, uh, a shop, and you, you're going in there to buy a half gallon of milk and you see something that doesn't add up, just get on a text tip and add it. We'll investigate it. And uh, just be resilient in regards to, uh, you know, having communication with your children and identifying things. And if you do identify them, act, act swiftly to uh, counter that uh, with with all the services that are available uh, here in Nauk. And you could start right here at the, the Nauk Police Department or at Margaret's uh, organization. We do have two licensed social workers uh, that do work out of our behavior health unit, and they work with varied uh, programs within the city. They do addiction recovery. They do... Um, post overdose follow-ups and they also do prevention and a lot of other family and social services. So just use the services that are available. Terrific. Well, a, a couple of uh, reminders, uh, as Margaret mentioned, there is a Narcan training coming up Wednesday, November 13th. I know you said six o'clock at Norwalk Library. Um, yeah. And Margaret, if people want any more information on that, um, would there should they access positive directions or how, how actually they I, I have it on uh, i don't actually have it on the positive directions website yet but i got to put it there but it's on the norwalkpartnership.org website on the right. events page you can register um we would like people to register so we know how much narcan we need that night um we will accommodate walk-ins as supplies last right right and this is for anyone, anyone who's yeah. interested in, in being yeah, trained. Yeah, we can, I, actually, I should say, we can only give Narcan for free to people over age 18. Um, it's it's a state, you know, I'm, I'm distributing stuff that comes to us from the state, but also just mentioned before, anyone can actually buy it in stores, um, but then it, depending what store you go to, it costs from 30 to $80. So it's nice to get it for free. Wonderful. And uh, for those tuning in, we will, um, as a follow-up email, provide other resources that relate to today's topic. So please look out for that. Um, and as we close, um, I have to tell you, I have learned a great deal from the three of you and, and Jess and Margaret, many, many thanks. And, and Chief Walsh, I have to tell you, not only what you've said today, but I walk away very, very impressed with the Norwalk Police Department and their focus and commitment in this area. Um, so congratulations to you and the department. I think uh, I've been very impressed with how engaged you are in this very, very challenging topic. So thank you. Many thanks to all three of you. Uh, for those of you who tuned in, I hope you walk away with as much new information and knowledge as I have. Um, stay tuned. We will be doing another of these uh, virtual conversations a few months down the road. 
hopefully on again on a topic that is very relevant to our audience. Um, and I want to thank you all. It's been it's been a great hour. So thank you both, all three of you. Take care now. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, FCA. <laughs>